<laughs> look, I just come, I just come from out there and look how they sound. Let her go. What are you doing? She's gonna go in there. <gasps> just leave it alone. Go give me some water. You understand? <laughs> okay. Sabbath peace. Sabbath peace. It's another opportunity for us to hear and learn of the word of truth that's given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast, and given freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe. In this state, you should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything excuse me, that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that couldn't make it, but no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. Let's go ahead and open up to uh, Isaiah chapter 28. Is Isaiah chapter 28, give me verse 9. It's Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Uh huh. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Doctrine is teaching, right? So it's asking, who is God going to teach knowledge to? Who is he going to make to understand that teaching? Keep going. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Right. Is it going to be babies he's asking? He's asking the question. Is it going to, it's going to be the ones that the babies that just got, got weaned? You know what I'm saying? Be, just got drawn from the breast? Who's it going to be? Let's see. The precept must be upon precept. He's saying it can't, going to be, it can't be the babies because you don't have to put precept upon precept. And what else? Precept upon precept. Uh-huh. Line upon line, line uh -huh. upon line, here a little and there a little. All right, so you got to put together a little puzzle. You say it can't be the babies. How the babies going to put together this, this puzzle? Right? Keep going, watch this. But with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. He said, I'm going to speak to this people with stammering lips and another tongue. Right? Imagine somebody speaking, speaking to you with another tongue. In other words, a different language. Right? Or even think of another tongue. Think of it. From, you know them people in church, they be speaking in tongues. You know what I'm saying? Imagine them speaking to you and they trying to tell you something. You looking like, what did they say? What the book say? If we we ain't got to grab, but if we if we went to uh, what uh, uh, First Corinthians chapter fourteen, what would it tell us about speaking in tongues? You gotta have an interpreter. You gotta have an interpreter, right? Because somebody speaking in tongues, somebody gotta be able to tell you what they saying. And you gotta, you gotta, you can only have at the most three people, and it has to be done in course. In other words, one at a time. That book, right? But you look at it, you got a bunch of people speaking in tongues. How are interpreters supposed to pick up all that? And how are you supposed to understand it if it ain't no interpreter? So in the same way, the Most High God said, "I'm speaking to you in another tongue." That means that, whoa, I'm not gonna understand them, right? The Most High God is saying, I'm speaking to you with a stammering, like, as if I got a stammer, right? As if I got a stuttering problem or as if I speak another language. In other words, I'm speaking to you in a way that you will not understand. It is important that we understand that piece. We, set the, we have to set the expectation for ourselves that the book, the word of the Most High God is delivered to us initially in a way that we will be confused by it. We won't know what God is saying. And so it's natural, therefore, for us to stand back and look and say, what in the world is God trying to say to me? What is his purpose for my life? What does he want me to do? What am I supposed to pull from this? What am I supposed to get from this? Those are natural questions. That's how it starts. When you were a baby, just weaned from the milk, drawn from the breast, that is how it's supposed to look to you. Then from there, you grow. Watch this. Right to whom he said, this is the rest, wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. Uh huh. And this is the refreshing. But yet, what? Yet they would not hear. They wouldn't hear, though. Yeah. Right? You had a group of people who he spoke yeah. to in another tongue, and they wouldn't hear. Yeah. That's what we can become guilty of. 
right? We put ourselves in a position like, man, what is God trying to say to me? What is God trying to do? It's a whole bunch of precept upon precept, a puzzle. I don't really understand it. I can't put it together. And then we say, you know what? Forget it. I think all religions have some validity to them. Really, the universe speaks to every different people in many different ways, right? To this culture, he speaks to them this way. That's why they got their gods. To this culture, he spoke to them this way. God is meeting everybody where they are and just giving them a different version in a way that they will understand as a way to... So we make up this whole theory in our brain just because we don't understand God. And guess what? In doing that, we stop hearing the word of God because we didn't understand it. He's speaking to us in the way we understand. So instead of sitting there and saying, you know what? I'm going to keep trying it and I'm going to try to grow in this thing. Instead, we say, nah, it must be something else. And we come up with our own theory. At that point, we become our own God, right? We start serving the God of our imagination, right? Which is not acceptable for us, right? We got to look at it and we got to look at the book and we got to say, okay, I don't get it and I don't understand it. And I don't know what the man is saying to me, but we're going to figure this out. Because I believe the man, I believe the man talking to me and I got I to gotta start to speak his language. I got to figure it out, right? But that take time. So he said, but they would not hear. Yes, they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little, uh -huh. that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. So you see the way he, he posed it to them. He said, who is, gonna, who is he going to teach the knowledge to? Is it going to be the babies, right? The one just weaned from the milk. He said, no, because it's going to be precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, right? He said, I'm speaking to them in a way that they don't understand. I'm speaking to the people. I said, this is the rest, where which you may cause the weary to rest. But they didn't hear me. They rejected my word. And therefore, the word was unto them, precept upon precept. In other words, it remained a puzzle. And read that last part again. Why did it remain a puzzle for them? What was the purpose of that? That they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. This whole thing is a trap. You can't fall for the trap. If you fall for the trap, you've then proven Satan to be right. Satan is accusing us right now, saying, or, or at a time, was accusing us before the Father, saying, these people ain't going to serve you. If this, 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 that, and the other happen, they ain't going to serve you. They ain't going to deny you to your darn face. Right? And when the word gets a little tough for us, what happened? Now, I'm going I'm to take something a little easier. Right? You know what I'm saying? You know, the Christian church is just a little more simple. I know it ain't right, but look, it's a little more simple. But that's what happened. What we have to do is we have to make sure that the word, this thing has to be deeper, to, to deeper, deeper than any praise of any people, deeper than any, deeper than any reputation or any notoriety. It just got to be deeper. We were just joking earlier about the views on our page. People look at the views and be like, man, this, you know what I'm saying? Y'all ain't got more views than this? Because they know the truth coming out. They know they like, they, listen, when they know, they know they heard something that they ain't never heard before. They looking like, why in the world y'all ain't got no darn views? Why is we got the weird couple weeks in a row the thing that came up, right? And you look at it, it's like, man, you can't move. That's what make people move in ways that's funny, bunny. That's what get these pastors to move in a certain place. It's like, in our mind, we can look at it and be like, man, I know we teaching the truth, right? We can say that in our mind, right? And then we can say, because I know we teaching the truth, the truth needs to get out. Those are two thoughts I have every day, right? But then I can take those thoughts and take it upon myself and say, you know what? To get the truth out, I'm going to I'm have to go and sit in one of these other churches and get this pastor to co-sign what I'm doing. And to get him to co-sign what I'm doing, okay, I'm going to acquiesce to what he teach a little bit and say, like, maybe he'd be right and maybe I'll start using, like, maybe I'll start wearing a cross. Like, I know the cross ain't nothing, but I'm aware because I know by doing that, he'll feel more comfortable and maybe he'll tell some of his members to listen to me and then I have more people. And it's more important, the cross ain't even important because I don't even believe in it. But guess what? It's more important that more eyes get put on the work of God that I'm doing. Right? That sounds logical to some people. 
It don't sound logical to me. Because if I got to compromise the word of the Most High God in order to spread the word of the Most High God, there's something wrong there. I'm the one that got tricked. The word going to stand up. Listen, it's one thing I trust. The word going to do what it do. I don't care if this thing reached two people. It's two people that it was supposed to reach. Period. It's the word. The word is going to do what it do. Period. I don't care if it reaches nobody on here and there's only one person that show up in the room. It reached who it's supposed to reach. I just got to make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, which is teach it accurately, right, and be honest. That's it. Take the same approach that, that the examples before us did in the book. And when we look at those examples, it wasn't nobody chasing nobody down, trying to please believe me. I've never seen that example. That's just not an example I have. I never seen no coward, you know what I'm saying? No coward is like just just please believe. No, save your life. I just want we ain't never begged nobody to, to, to believe the truth. That's crazy to me. It's just not in the book. In fact, the opposite in the book. Don't throw your pearl before before the swan. Yep. Right? Let the blind, you know what I'm saying? Let the blind lead lead the blind. Yep. They both fall into a darn ditch. That's the opposite of this. It is this attitude of like, no, everybody must believe. No, nah, man. If you're going to believe, you're going to believe. And you're not going to believe, you're not going to believe. Guess what ain't going to stop me, though? None of that. That's exactly what I said. Right? It's exactly what I said. Ain't nothing going to stop it. Right? Two views, three views, one view, zero views. Guess what? Book still the book. Stuff don't mean nothing to me. Let's go to, uh, this, is, uh, this is Hebrews, let's do Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Pick up where we left off. So we finally we finished all the milk, huh? Didn't we read 6? No, we didn't read, did, did we read all the 6? I don't think so. I think we just read the beginning of it. Boys, go in the room and close the door. Y'all too loud. Hmm. Where's TJ? Zahar. Yeah. Tell TJ I said get in here. Tell, tell TJ I said. Yeah, sure. Sit down. All right. Mm -hmm. He's a convenient. <laughs> conveniently yeah. came out when I called. Got done him. just in time. <laughs> just white. <laughs> So I thought you were pooping. You, you got down I when I called you? Then I checked on Esri. She was in the tent eating the cards. Okay. It's Hebrews chapter 6. Give me verse 1. Let's see what the book say. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of the Messiah, let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, uh -huh. of the doctrine of baptism and of laying on of hands and uh -huh. the resurrection of the dead mm -hmm. and of eternal judgment. All right, so we talked about all these, right? We talked about sins last week and we talked about all of these in previous weeks. So let's keep going. Oh, excuse me. And this we will do if God permits. Uh huh. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost uh -huh. and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, mm -hmm. if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Uh -huh. For the earth which drinks in the rain that comes off upon it, often upon it, and brings forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receives blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is near unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. All right, hold on right there. Grab uh, Genesis chapter 3. It's Genesis chapter 3. What? Okay. No. How do you need no darn blanket? Oh, you need no blanket. Get over here. There's a blanket right there. Sit down, boy. 
Why do you always need a blanket? Why do you always need extra stuff just to sit down? Verse what? Uh, let's try verse 14. That's a wild shot in the dark, but let's see what happens. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed to all cattle. Yeah, that's what I want. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. All right, so before this, he came to Adam. He said, Adam, you know what I'm saying? What happened? Did you eat the fruit? You know what I'm saying? I was like, nah, man, it's the woman that gave it to me. Right? Then the woman said, man, that's the serpent. So he looked at the serpent. He was like, all right, because serpent, because you did this. And he punished, punished the serpent first. But who did he speak to first? The man. And watch who he speak to last. Right? Remember the book, everything, who was it about? Yahushua. Sure. whole book is about Yahushua. Sure. So when it comes to Yahushua, sure, he said the first shall be last. And the last shall be, shall be first. I got that. So watch it. He spoke to Adam first, but watch who he speak to last. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle, mm -hmm. and above every beast of the field. And upon your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Mm -hmm. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and it shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Mm -hmm. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In so sorrow, he to the serpent, now he's speaking to the woman. Keep going. In sorrow you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. Mm -hmm. And unto Adam he said... That, that comes from the order. Now that, that describes the order of a man and a woman. Right? This is, this is part of the order that the Most High God set up as a consequence of what happened in, in Eden. Right? That the woman will seek and want to be ruled over men. Right? Keep going. A lot of people look at that one. Well, I don't want no man ruling on me. You might not. And there's some women that have child, children, and it's you know it's not as painful for them, right? Some people, some people had a testimony that it wasn't painful at all when they had babies, right? You you got your own little testimony, your own little story. You have it all. I'm just telling you what the Most High God said in this book, right? Keep going. Watch this. And unto Adam he said, because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife and has eaten of the tree. Of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake, and sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. He said, Cursed is the ground for your sake, and sorrow shall you eat of it for the rest of the days of your life. Watch this. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you. What? Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to you. Thorns and thistles is going to bring forth to you. I told y'all to go in the room, and I told y'all to close the door. Then go somewhere else, downstairs. Keep going. Thorns and what? Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. Right? Now watch this. Go back to Hebrews. Let's see what it says there. What happened to Adam and Eve after this conversation? They were kicked out of the garden. They were kicked out of, uh, kicked out of Eden. Never to find their way back to the tree of life, right? Mm -hmm. Now watch what we read here in uh, Hebrews chapter 6. What verse we leave off? Uh, 8. This is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 8. Watch what the book say. But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is near unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Right? So where do you think he got this from, the writer of Hebrews? He knows our scripture. Right? Yeah. Knowing our scripture... He was able to set it forth and be like, listen, Adam got rejected, right? And the sign of his rejection was that when he dig up out of the ground, a sign of his rejection when he dig up out of the ground, it's going to be thorns and thistles, right? Keep going, watch this. Whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you mm -hmm. and things that accompany salvation through... Uh, though we thus speak, mm -hmm. 
For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, and that you have mis ministered to the saints and do minister. Uh -huh. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, Deadly. because he could swear by Deadly. no greater, he swear by himself. Saying, surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. Uh -huh. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation in them is to them an end of all strife. Uh -huh. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability, immutability of his counsel confirmed, in, confirmed it by an oath. Esri, sit down. The, uh, let's see. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consol consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Mm -hmm. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, in which enters into that within the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us entered by Yahushua, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Mm hmm Keep going. It's well, chapter seven. Melchizedek. Yeah. So you remember in chapter five, we didn't read it today, but remember chapter five tells us, chapter five, he said, uh, you know what I'm saying? I would love to be able to go on to the strong food. You know what I'm saying? I got stuff to tell y'all about Melchizedek, but y'all ain't even ready. Y'all ought to be teachers by now. Right? Then he went on to talk about, you know what I'm saying, the, the foundation and the principles and all that good stuff. Then we go over that. But then you see he worked his way back around to talk about Melchizedek after talking. He's like, man, let's go on. I don't want to lay again the foundation of repentance from dead work and faith toward God and baptism and laying on the hands and, and uh, uh, eternal, uh, eternal, uh, what was it? Eternal, uh, eternal judgment, eternal life and judgment, right? He's like, I don't want to go on and go through these things again, right? So we, we rewind it. He's like, okay. Let's talk about that. Okay, now let me get back to Melchizedek. Now watch what he said about Melchizedek. Let's see. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who, made Abra who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the king. King of what? Of the Most High, a priest of the Most High God. King of Salem, right? King of Salem is what? King of what? King of peace. King of peace. Sound familiar, don't it? Yeah. Keep going. Watch this. To whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Mm -hmm. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continually. Right? So he's telling us that Melchizedek testified of Yahushua. Now let's grab it. Let's grab Melchizedek. What is it? Uh, Genesis... Well, no, kids, it's gonna be like Genesis 14 or Genesis 13. Genesis 14, I think. It's important for us to do this because a lot of times I've had people message me and they say, "Well, you know, I see when y'all try to say like certain stuff in the Bible be talk." One of the ones that get them is when I say Lucifer testifies of Yahushua. And Edom testifies of Yahushua. They don't like that. They don't like that at all. Make them feel weird. You know what I'm saying? Because you think of Edom, the Hebrew thing, Edom is the white man. So when I get to telling them, like, oh, okay, yeah, but when Jacob, you know what I'm saying, put on Edom's, you know what I'm saying, when he, when he tried to make himself smell and feel like Edom, that's the same way that we got to put on Yahushua. And Jacob represented us while Edom represents Yahushua. They don't like that. Make them feel uncomfortable. You know what I'm saying? When I tell them, like, Lucifer, when they say Lucifer, the son of the morning, the day star, which is exactly what Yahushua is called, the day star. In Revelation. Right? In Revelation, then by Peter. Right? So when you look at it, it's like, oh, no, but that's not what it's talking about. And then it, and then it described the man. He says, him who had the whole world shook. 
and you fail? Ain't that the way they're talking to the man? Oh, you supposed to be the son of God and you hanging up on the cross. If you the man, get yourself down. If you read that what's in Lucifer, it's the same conversation. Because it testifies of the man. But it make them uncomfortable. So what I want them to do is like, even though you think this is talking about one thing, and you think we just making stuff up and pulling it, you would think the same thing about the writers of the, of the New Testament. What just happened there? Mm -hmm. Are we still recording? Oh, so. Um, but uh, no, it's not. It's not live. It's not. I, have to, uh, I don't know what's going on in this house tonight. You know, all these kids. But um, yeah, so we have to we have to be able to to separate the the first layer of the story that's being presented to us, and then always have in the back of our mind that everything written testifies of Yahushua. And when you do that, make it clear. But I like to look at the examples of the, of the writers of Hebrews because we believe them. We know that they solidified. So the writer of Hebrews said, listen, Melchizedek is made onto just like the sun, right? So now let's look at Melchizedek the way the writer of Hebrews would have had to read him first and ask ourselves, wow, how did he come up with that, right? And then we'll be able to use that same model when we read the scriptures, right? So this is uh, Genesis, I think it's Genesis 14, ain't it? Genesis Should be at the end. 14, 17. It's Genesis chapter 14, verse 17. Let's see what the book say. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedolam, Kedor, Kedorlamor. Uh -huh. And the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God. Right? <laughs> look, bread and wine. Look, what else? And he was what? The priest of the Most High God. A priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered thine enemies into thy hand. Mm -hmm. And he gave him tithes of all. Right? And then he tied to, uh, Abraham tied to Melchizedek, being a priest. Right? So the he writer of Hebrews is recognizing that, and he read that. Now, we have to stop and we have to ask ourselves, of any of us that read that, how many of us would have been like, oh, that's Yahushua? Off our first read, we ain't about to look at that and say, that's Yahushua? Only the Spirit of God going to move you to say something like that. Right? So that's why the writer of Hebrews is able to do that and present it to us that way, because he's been blessed with understanding and in the same way, when we read through the scriptures, we read through the scripture and we can get the same thing out of it. We can look, and when the Most High God move on us, we can see, oh, that testifies to Yahushua. Right? Let's, uh, let's go back. This is writer of Hebrews. This is Hebrews chapter what? Seven, verse what? Three. It's Hebrews chapter seven, verse three. I was about to say, is that my baby crying? But no, I think that's uh Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continually. Uh-huh. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the, of the spoils. Uh-huh. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. That's right. That is, of their brethren, Though they come out of the loins of Abraham. That's right. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. And as I may, as I, and as I may so say, Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were made by Levitical priesthood, for under, it, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of a necessity a change also of the law. That's right. For he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, 
of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. He said Moses didn't say anything about the priesthood coming from Judah. That boy knew the law, you know what I'm saying, whoever wrote this one. Right? Let's look at it, though. Let's go to Exodus. Let's go to the law. This is Exodus chapter 30. That boy knew what he was talking about. It's important. Look, the writer of Hebrews, just like the brothers just said, he know the book. He know he the know law. He's talking about. He breaks it down. Very. He's looking like he's looking like. Okay, Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek, right? From Abraham came the priests, whom we say all tithes go to them. So who's superior then? If the man who gave birth. To the, to, the, to the people who we got to give all our tithes to ended up giving tithes to this man and all of them ended up tithing through Abraham to Melchizedek. And if he is that great, right, why then do we need, now we need a better priesthood because he is that great. And if we need a better priesthood, then we need a new law because Moses spoke nothing about Judah having a priesthood. Something totally different. So we need a new law now because we need somebody that's better than the priest, right? Which is Yahushua, just like Melchizedek. That's was. why he says after the order of Melchizedek, because he was a priest of God. So now we he need was a the new priest law. of God that had the father of the priest submitting tithes to him with no beginning of life and no end of days, right? So now we need a new law. So now we, like Moses didn't tell us, like it's not lawful for us to just make up a priest, right? Moses didn't tell us nothing about any priest coming outside of Aaron. This Melchizedek dude wasn't no descendant of Aaron, but he was greater than who we think is the greatest, right? Like Yahushua, right? So he's like, but Yahushua came from Judah. Moses didn't tell us that a priest was coming from Judah. Moses said nothing about a priest coming from Judah. But watch this. This is Exodus chapter 30. Is what he did tell us. Exodus chapter 30, verse 30. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, and that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. That's right. So who did he make the priest? Aaron and his son. Aaron and his son. Who anointed him? Moses. Okay, keep going. And you shall speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Uh -huh. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured, neither shall ye make any other like it after the co composition of it. All right. It is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. So, I wanted to keep that part in there because a lot of people take on, you get, you get this holy anointing oil, right? And then they use it and say, Oh, this is holy anointing oil. And they get to rubbing it on people and blessing them. Read that again for me. Upon my own flesh, what? Neither shall you make any other like it after the composition of it. It is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. Now, go back one before that. Oh. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. Neither shall you make any other like it. You don't pour this oil. This is a specific composition. He's going to give you exact, exact instructions on how to use it. And how to uh, how to make it? That should not be poured on anybody. In fact, that should not be made unless you're a priest, right? Moses made it first, but that should not be made unless you're a priest. And if we kept reading it, it'll tell you that too, right? But who made it first? Moses. Moses, right? This is Leviticus chapter uh, eight. Leviticus chapter eight, verse thirty. Watch what the book say. These are details that are important. A lot of people don't know this. A lot of people don't pay attention to this. And Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood which was upon the altar and sprinkled it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and his uh, and upon his sons' garments. Go go up a little bit. Uh, that's verse thirty. What I want? Maybe uh, verse twenty. What did it say? Verse twenty. Mm-hmm. And he cut the ram into two. Into oh, two. give me verse. I don't know. Start at verse one. Let's look at verse one. Let's just go. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him. 
and the garments and the anointing oil and the bullock for the sin offering and two rams and a basket of unleavened bread. So now this is him about to consecrate, about, about to separate Aaron and his, and his sons for the priesthood, right? So at this point, there are no priests, right? Watch this. Take Aaron and his sons with him. Oh, wait, my bad. And gather thou all the congregation together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Mm -hmm. And Moses did as Yahuwah commanded him. And the assembly was gathered together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses said unto the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. Mm -hmm. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. He washed him with water. And he put upon him the coat and girded him with the girdle and clothed him with the robe uh -huh. and put the ephod upon him. And he girded him with the curious girdle of the ephod and bound it unto him three therewith. Mm -hmm. And he put the breastplate upon him also and put the breastplate of uh, the urim and the thummim. Mm -hmm. And he put the mitre upon his head also upon the mitre even upon his forefront did he put the golden plate. Moses had the to get the man crowd. dressed, right? Watch it. Keep going. As Yahuwah commanded Moses, and Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them. And he right? Took, so he anointed what? He anointed, he took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle. He anointed the tabernacle. And all that was therein. And everything that was in it. And sanctified them. Right? He anointed the tabernacle. Who has the right to use the tabernacle? The priest. The priest. Who was the first person to anoint it? Moses. Moses. Watch this. What happened if anybody else touched the, the, the tabernacle? Okay. Let's see. Keep going. And he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all his vessels, both the laver and its foot, to uh -huh. sanctify them. Mm -hmm. And he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. Mm -hmm. And Moses brought Aaron's sons... And put coats upon them, and girded them with girdles, and put bonnets upon them, as the Lord commanded Moses. Watch this. And he brought the bullock. For he the brought the offering. what? The bullock for the sin offering. Now hold on. Who gonna handle that bullock? Moses. Cause I mean, who's supposed to be doing sacrifices? The priest. On the altar. The priest. Is there anybody else that can do any sacrifices on the altar? No. Only the priest, right? Right. Okay. Let's see what happens. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the bullock for the sin offering. Mm -hmm. And he slew it. And Moses took the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar round about with his finger and purified the altar and poured the blood at the bottom of the altar and sanctified it to make reconciliation upon it. M Moses made the sacrifice. And he took all the fat that was upon the inwards and the call above the liver and the two kidneys and their fat and Moses burned it upon the altar. But Moses the burned it upon the altar. But the bullock and his hide, his flesh, and his dung, he burnt with fire outside the camp, as Yahuwah commanded him. Why is this important? Why am I taking us here? What have we learned about Moses so far? Moses put everybody on. Right. Moses is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, too. Because he's not a son of Aaron. Right? Right? He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, too. And he was king in Jeshurun. See, everything, the book tells us everything that we need to know. It said, it's going to be a prophet that comes. Like unto me. Talking about Moses. Like unto Moses. Right, so they said he got to come. He got to, he got to. When Yahushua show up, he got to be able to point back and be like, just like Moses. Yeah. He got to, because that's said, book. If Moses' know, whole life got to testify of Yahushua. He said, if you don't believe my words, right? If he's like, if you don't believe Moses, how are you going to believe me? Right. When he was talking to the Pharisees. Like, right? So Moses was a, 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 a priest, uh, was like a priest unto, uh, unto the order of Melchizedek as well. Right? So we look at it, reading it, you may not notice that. You may not pick that up. Right. Well, how Moses can do these sacrifices? It's supposed to only be Aaron. Right? So when people look at that and be like, man, nah, there's some Hebrews out there be like, nah, only Aaron can do sacrifices. There's no way that Yahushua can be the sacrifice. There's no way that Yahushua could then, could then, could then make a sacrifice. Okay, for sure. I understand what you're saying. Tell me how Moses did it. 
Did tell me how it's written there? Yep. Tell me how Moses did it. When you explain that to me, get back to me. No, see, God made the okay, then God can do that again then. That's it. I mean, as soon as you get the, because these people don't know the book. They don't study the law. You know what they know? Man, the Sabbath. From sundown to sun up. I could raise up children out of these stones. Yeah. Hey, whole, you know what they know? You know what they know? Passover, brother. Nissan, 14. They tell you all that? Oh, see, no, the Day of Atonement, man. We we fast. The law said we supposed to fast from sundown to sundown, but you know, sometimes we like to fast for three days straight. Okay, that's fine. You do what you want to do. You don't know no law. <laughs> You killing a whole bunch of time. Your buddy might as well get you a cheeseburger. You don't know no darn law. What good man do? You know what they'll say now? We eat no pork. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You. I'm with you. But guess what? You still, that ain't the law. Don't get me wrong. That's the law. But that ain't, you can't hang your hat because you know all the flesh pieces of the law, all the part that governs your carnal flesh, and feel like, oh, I know the law. No, no, no. You know the law. When you can look at that thing and teach the gospel from it. That's law. When you can open up the law and teach the gospel from it. That's law. That's what the writer of Hebrews is doing right now. These are bad boys that we read. These boys, these boys on a different level. Every one of them that we read, they are on a different level. Who, who do we know that could ever break down the book like this? I can't get up here and break down no book like this without them breaking it down for me. Could you imagine not having their writing and being able to open this book up and just be like, oh, well, no, I just, I just know the law. So what? Are you serious? These boys didn't have nothing other than the spirit of the Most High God. They ain't had no New Testament. They ain't have no Old Testament. They didn't. They knew they had the law. The law and the prophet. And they had the spirit. Yeah. It wasn't, These boys ought to be ashamed of themselves. They exalt themselves against the apostles. Exalt themselves as, as prophets. Shut your darn mouth. You ain't nothing. You don't, You can't even break down simple stuff that's already written. It's already written and you don't get it. Yeah. That's These boys breaking down stuff that ain't even there. They trying to show it to you like what you think this These them boy, I mean, I just, I tell you what, I read these boy. I think it just excites me. I be, I be looking there. I just be in awe reading this stuff. Like goodness gracious, cause I put myself there. Like what? Like how did the Most High have to move in you? Like imagine how that feel for you to just be reading like the stuff that we just read, and you just reading that, and then all this stuff that's not actually written explicitly there just jump out at you, and it's fact. That just got to feel different because you know that's God moving. You know that's God moving. I be getting a little excited when he give me a little something, something. But then I be like, I get excited about that. And there's a, there's a temptation to exalt yourself. Like, man, God gave this to me. But then you think about it and be like, but man, I had the whole New Testament. And, I, and you know what I'm saying? I, I had that built up. These boys doing better than this and didn't have nothing. Just the law and the prophets. He's a bad boy. It's just that sometimes we just got to take a step back and honor the men that God honored. Yeah. Right? Because that's where the honor should come from. It should come from God. When God honors something, it's like, oh, man, I appreciate that. God know what he's doing. I know that. I can trust that. There's some few things I can trust in the world. One of them is that God know what he's doing. Let's see. Let's go back to uh, Hebrews chapter 7. What verse we leave off on? Uh, 14. This is Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. Let's see what the book said. That no matter what, it's going to take us time, man. It's going to take us time to understand it. It ain't no race to try to. To try to, you know, see Yahushua in the scriptures. Just let it come to you, man. The most important thing is you look into the book. You understand what the Most High God is saying to you. What the commandment is. What the demand is on your life. And then you walk in it. Ain't nothing better than that. Everything else going to come, man. But you can't skip. A lot of people skip. They want to move too quick. We always talk about Mary and Martha. 
Remember Martha, she just wanted to move. She wanted to serve. Ain't nothing wrong with that. You want to serve, you want to serve good. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But you got to understand the f most important thing is what? What's the most? Before you get out there and start working and serving and all that stuff, when it comes to God, what you got to do? Gotta you got to know. You got to know the book. You got to learn it. Because otherwise, you're going to put yourself in a position where you're working and you're moving and you're making actions and you're doing stuff and you're going to be in error because you don't know. Everything going to feel good to everybody. Yep. Right? Everything always going to feel good. But you got to know. You got to know the book well enough to say, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do in this moment. And I know because of this chapter verse in scripture. Right? This is uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, uh -huh. of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Uh -huh. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest mm -hmm. who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of... After a law of a what? Carnal commandment. Of a what? Carnal commandment. How in the world can they call... A, a, how can a writer of Hebrews call the law carnal? There's another one that the, the Hebrew Israelites don't like. They don't like it when I take it in because you like you got to accept that. Yeah, but Paul said the law is spiritual. He, he did. He did. So now we got to ask ourselves... How are both right? He said, after the what? Carnal commandment. So you got a carnal commandment. What does that mean? Like guard the flesh, fleshly. Why is, are, why is the commandments in the law carnal? A lot of them, a lot of them govern the flesh, like you said. Mm -hmm. Hey, talking about eat this, don't eat that. Mm -hmm. That's flesh. That's my body. Wash this. It says wash. wash. That, yeah. You know what I'm saying? If you get leprosy, you wash this. You know what I'm saying? It's teaching me how to govern. When they say carnal, when we think carnal, a lot of times we think evil or bad. Right? But in this sense, it's not telling you carnal as in even evil or bad. It's telling you that the law was meant to govern your, fre your flesh. Mm -hmm. And that's what it did. There are parts of the law, well, the whole law is spiritual in the sense that it's going to predict and push you to Yahushua. And it's going to also govern not only your, your flesh, but it's going to govern your behavior that will then cause you to live in the spirit. Right? Mm -hmm. So it is spirit. It leads you to the spirit. And it is also carnal. It governs your carnal, your carnal body. Right? Keep going. Watch this. For he testifies... Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitness thereof. Mm -hmm. For the law made nothing perfect, but mm -hmm. the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw near unto God. Mm -hmm. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath. But this was an oath by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and it will not rep and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. By so much was Yahshua made a surety of a better testament. And they truly... When he said that, he reading from the psalm. A psalm said that, right? Keep going. By so much, Yahshua was made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests. I just want us to take a step back. You have to understand how bad this man was, man. How Like, you have to understand, like... He read, a, he read, I like to imagine, he started off with Psalm, right? He already read Melchizedek a couple times. But then he saw the Psalm that said, you are a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Then he went back and he read it again. And the spirit moved on him was like, it just opened it up for him. And the man can look at it and be like, oh, man, let, let, me, show, let me break this down. I want to break it down for y'all, but y'all still on the basics. Y'all to be teachers by now. I mean, Y'all still on the basis. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, let me get you there then. Yes. Michael, uh, push, uh. All right, y'all go, go deal with it, and then I'm teaching. But, uh, you know what I'm saying? He, he can look at that, and he can go back to it, and it opens all the way up. Go on, boy. Go figure it out. Go. Go. You can look at it, and you can, you can, you can, you can, you can put it together and say, this is what this represents, right? 
I know a few things. I know Yahushua is real. I know the psalm tell me you are he, talking to somebody that you're going to be a priest forever ever after the order of Melchizedek. And I know the story of Melchizedek. And from that, he looked at me like, oh, that's talking about him. You know what I'm saying? And then he just took it and put, to me, that is amazing. That is amazing. Yeah, he ain't talking nothing. This ain't written in no darn Gentile. These Gentiles be lost. How about these Gentiles? When was the last time you seen a Gentile read out of the book of Hebrew? When was the last time you went to one of these churches of people taught by Gentiles? Or they think they Gentile, right? A lot of our people think they Gentile. When you went to the people that think they Gentile and they opened up Hebrews and start reading? Well, they will read faith come with... Uh, or they get you that. Oh, they get you a Hebrew chapter 11. Hebrews 11, 1. And we'll stop. That. They ain't even going to get to 11, 2. You know what I'm talking about? That thing stop right at 11, 1. And they ain't going to read it. They going to misquote it. You know what I'm saying? They going to paraphrase that thing. They ain't going to open the book and read it. That's too much. Hebrews will light they butt up. You trying to stand? This is uh, uh, keep going. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Uh huh. But this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. Okay. For such a high priest became, became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, uh -huh. who needs not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. Right? Our, our, our priests now don't have to offer sin, uh, sacrifice for his sin. We didn't read it, but that's what uh, Moses had to do as well. Right? We didn't read that part, but Moses had to offer a sacrifice for himself at first. And then he sacrificed for, uh, for Aaron. Keep going. Watch this. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Uh-huh. For the law makes men high priests which have infirmity. But the word of the oath which was since the law, was, which was since the law, makes the son who is consecrated forevermore. Mm-hmm. Senator Chuck. We'll stop right there. We'll, we'll pick up next week. All right. So it's important that we understand these things. And the intricacies as we start to get into the more complex stuff for the Most High God, right? Because eventually we got to make it to Revelations, and in order for us to understand all this, the, for the all this that we've been doing for the last several weeks is in preparation for Revelations, right? Because we have to understand how to look at the Scriptures and see what's not explicitly there. The reason why it's not explicitly there is because this book has to be understood precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. That's why the writer of Hebrews got to look at you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, connected to Melchizedek, and then connected to the gospel, right? And tie all of that together and say, this is who it's talking about. In the same way, we have to do those same things, just like we did some of that today, right? It will continue to have to do those things as we get into Revelations. But in Revelations, it's a lot of things that you have to be able to look at and see what's not explicitly there for it to, for it to start to click. Right. So we're going to start to try to go over some of that, get us pre pre prepared so we can look at the book in a certain way. So when we get to Revelations, it's very clear what we're dealing with. All right. Any questions? All right. Let's pray out.